with a series of autumn breakfasts um, to talk about hot policy issues in the health and care sector. Um, I think we will be expecting a few others to uh, join us, uh, but I wanted us to get underway because we've got um, a, a lot of experts on a panel that I want to make sure we've got time to hear from and uh, enough time for debate and discussion in the room. Um, so I'm really delighted uh, that our first breakfast uh, this season in the uh, after the parliamentary summer recess is around social care funding. Um, this is very much my specialist subject uh, for around about the last decade or so. I've been working uh, mainly in government on how to fix social care. Um, I would say it's, it's, I've had a ringside seat across three different governments uh, doing social care reform, but quite often it felt like I went 10 rounds in the ring, particularly with some of my cross-government colleagues trying to persuade them to spend a lot of money on social care reform. So I'm particularly uh, delighted to welcome our panel today to talk about social care reform, why we need to fix it, although I suspect we're all experts in the room on that, what success would look like for us uh, and what the prospects for reform will be. Um, I'll do a few uh, minor kind of housekeeping just to make sure everybody's uh, aware and safe. So the first thing uh, to say is there is no fire alarm planned for today. If a fire alarm does go off, it is therefore real. So please do um, evacuate the room. If you need any help uh, leaving the room, then please do stay here and King's Fund staff will help you uh, uh, leave the, the space and take you to the, uh, the fire safety point. Um, we clearly uh, would be keen to see people tweeting throughout the course of today, so we do have Wi-Fi today. This is at the top of the slides here. So the network is 11 Cavendish SQ, uh, and the password is lavender, uh, all lowercase. Um, and where you are tweeting, the hashtag should be hashtag KF Social Care, uh, with a capital S, although I'm not sure it makes huge amounts of difference. Um, so what we'll be doing today is hearing first off from our four panellists about their perspective on social care reform um, and then we should have a good 45 minutes to be able to have debate and discussion in the room as a whole. Um, before I hand over to the panellists, if I remind people what the context of today's event was, uh, and although it must be said it's quite hard to uh, predict, well, to talk about the context in politics at the moment. Um, so in the summer, in July, the Prime Minister uh, was elected by Conservative Party members, um, and as part of his uh, entering number 10, he talked about fixing social care once and for all. Uh, so we were anticipating in September, second week back for Parliament, uh, the Prime Minister has talked about putting out uh, options very quickly. We thought we'd be days, weeks away from some proposals from government about how to fix social care. Uh, it appears government and parliament didn't read that script uh, and have come up with some slightly different plans for September. Um, so it doesn't feel like we are quite as close to a set of proposals uh, coming out imminently, but the Prime Minister has still committed to fixing social care. The Chancellor last week in the spending review talked about fixing social care and proposals being published in due course. So we can still anticipate that the government is seriously considering its options around social care reform. So today's a good uh, point for us to step back, reflect on what success would mean for us in the sector uh, and to uh, hopefully continue to put pressure on our political leaders to be able to uh, successfully deliver reform for us. So uh, with no further ado, I'm going to pass on to our panellists uh, and we're going to go this way down uh, the, uh, the group. So I'm going to delighted to introduce Alison Holt uh, from the BBC, who many of you will know from the Panorama programme uh, around Somerset uh, social care in Somerset, which was so powerful in terms of really bringing home the realities of the social care system and what is wrong with it in a really people-based way. So, Alison, over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Morning. Well, as Sally has just said, I'm going to concentrate on what we found in Somerset. I'm sure a lot of what I say will ring true for many of you from your own particular experiences. But what I would say is my privilege as a journalist is being able to go in and look at different perspectives. So part of the attempt during these two panoramas was to go around and look at decisions that were being made from a 360 degree perspective to get an idea of what the reality was. Because so often decisions that are made at Westminster, by councils, by local social care teams, are, feel disconnected from what the reality is for people. So sometimes I will go somewhere and they'll tell me, we've got this brilliant scheme and it's doing this. 
and then I go and see someone who is the recipient of that brilliant scheme. And yes, they may be pleased with one thing, but there are other bits of the system that just aren't working for them. So we wanted to see what the reality was like um, in one place. We picked Somerset because it has one of the fastest aging populations. It's a large rural county, largely rural county. It has, um, it's not particularly wealthy and the council would let us in, which was a major factor. Um, for those who didn't see the programmes, I would sum up what we found by saying it showed a series of impossible decisions which played out in what was basically distress, hardship and confusion in people's lives. We saw a lot of people working really, really hard to try and make the system work. So whether that was Chris, who was running the social work team um, in the west of the county, who um, was putting her body and soul into the job that she was doing. She cared deeply about the people she was trying to look after. But she was also struggling to recruit social workers, and she had to try and keep up with demand at a time when their budgets were being cut. Then there was Stephen Chandler, the director of adult social care, literally head in his hands at times, trying to make those decisions of, how do I keep these services going on this amount of money? And then the politicians having to decide where to make cuts so that they could then balance their books. So impossible decisions being made on that sort of administrative functional level, but then how did it play out in the lives of people? Well, the reality for people when they need care is generally that they will come to the care system at a point of crisis, and then they are confronted by a system that is underfunded, under pressure, and extremely confusing. And um, it often doesn't give them the support that they need. So what I've tried to do is, uh, I was sitting down trying to think what were the different problems, the key problems that we encountered in terms of people's lives. Um, so my quick list, and I suspect there are more, is that councils increasingly have to concentrate their resources on those with the highest needs. So it becomes very narrowly focused. That then leaves the problem of unmet need. People who would benefit from a little bit of help, but they can't get that help. Or often they don't know that they might be entitled to it. Um, that then means the point at which they do encounter the system is the point of crisis. And we all know about the knock-on effect, the, the frequently talked about knock-on effect on the NHS of delayed discharges, of pressures on um, accident and emergency. It also means that under the current system, meaningful early intervention is difficult. Increasingly, um, areas rely on charities or voluntary support. Well, I would say from what we've seen. That is fantastic as far as it is possible to go, but it's a finite resource. And there are questions which about whether or not or how much we should rely on that in terms of some quite core care for people. People don't know what to expect. Many believe that they will be funded by the NHS. Now the care that you get in terms of social care is so complex compared with what it might have been 20, 30, 40 years ago, people don't really understand what's going um, on in terms of social care. They think the NHS pays. Self-funders subsidizing the system, a complex system where people bump between the systems of council funding and self-funding, endless time-consuming arguments over who should pay, council, NHS, or the individuals. And on that note, I just want to read a little bit to you from a text that one of the carers who was in the program sent to us at the weekend, and her partner's been in hospital for quite a chunk of time. During that time, they have lost entitlement to NHS continuing health care for his support at home. Uh, so she texted my colleague Angie. Uh, there was a long drawn out argument between the different departments about who was responsible for financing his care. One said they were, then one said they weren't. And that went on for ages. There were meetings and more meetings, I expect costing the NHS a fortune. Well, eventually they decided there was a particular pot of money where he should get care from. And she continues, anyway, guess what? That is still not in place. What a shambles the whole thing is. You couldn't make it up if you tried. 
I have to keep smiling because otherwise I just cannot stop crying. She ends by saying he's coming home on Tuesday, so today, and we start again. It just goes on and on. That is the reality of the way in which the system is functioning. During the 10 months we were filming, we followed eight families, and in that time, three of those people died. So personal tragedies, but also surely we should be making those systems function better. What I would say, because I'm going to wind up now, because I think m most of the, the issues around the p political process are best addressed by others, but from my experience, commentating on the system, it has, we have to educate people more about how it functions, how it works, so they know what is being talked about when there is any debate about the future of social care. And it needs, to be, it needs not to be a political football. It is too important for that. It has to be removed from the political realm so that a, a decision or an, a, a mechanism for funding care in the future is one that parties work together on to create. Because in the end, I would argue, from the experience I have of seeing the realities of the system, this is a question of what sort of a society we want to be. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison. And just before I invite Emily uh, to give her reflections, um, I was so excited about this being my specialist subject that I forgot a couple of the housekeeping points. Uh, so one is we are being live streamed on YouTube uh, at the moment. So welcome to those joining us via the live stream. So obviously we want just to, for you all to know in the room, should you ask a question, it's on, uh, it will be on YouTube. And there are some journalists present in the room as well. So again, just from a transparency point of view. But with those final bits, um, delighted to welcome Emily Holtzhausen onto uh, the podium. Emily is the Director of Policy at Carers UK, but also the co-chair of the Carers Support Alliance um, that's been working tirelessly for uh, not far off that last decade to yes. uh, seek reform yes. as well. So yes. over to you, Emily. Thank you ever so much, Sally. And, um, it's, it's an absolute pleasure to be with such a fantastic panel and with all of you experts in the room as well. I'm going to talk a little bit more about the perspective from disabled people, older people, people needing care, and of, and of course families. I've been working in the sector on social care for about 28 years now. And I remember my time back then was really a discussion, the, the heated debate within the disability movement and the older people's movement was really about how a health bath, how a bath was free and then was being paid for and about the introduction of charging for social care services. So that was my foundation in social care. And you think where we are now, that health bath for the majority is not a health bath if it's even a bath at all. So that is one of the reasons why we urgently need to look at this. Um, a lot of you know some of the stats, 1.4 million older people going without the sorts of services that they need. And just to bring you back a bit, that's double the number in 2010. And for those of you working this, we, we thought that was quite shocking then, but it's double now. Um, disabled people are not getting the basic services that they need. The Care and Support Alliance did uh, a survey in in uh, 2018 and 2019 and found that people weren't able to get out of the house, they weren't necessarily being fed properly. These are fundamental services that people need every day of their lives, including older people. There's kinds of services, the quality services that you need to get out of bed and dressed and fed well in a time that um, is right for you. Um, in 2018, the Care and Support Alliance found that 29% of 16 to 64-year-olds had had their, their funding cut for services. And MENCAP was starting to find whether those, you know, MENCAP was questioning whether all of those processes were entirely legal. So it really shows um, uh, a, a system in crisis. And for parents of disabled children, transition is very tough, but coming into this adult world is extremely, is extremely scary. And then when we come to families, a, a survey done of social workers, 81% of social workers admitted that the pressure they were under in terms of funding cuts, they were having to place additional pressure on families. We've seen 
um, the number of people who are caring going up. And that's, that's not a zero-sum game for the Treasury either. Those have enormous costs. Um, carers' health and well-being is under pressure. There are other parts of their family life they need to, look to, need to attend to. And if you saw um, Rogan Productions, um, fantastic film done with Alison and the BBC, you will have seen David and his wife, Martine, who sadly passed away, um, and their three triplets. David was trying to, was self-employed, up several times in the night caring for Martine because he couldn't get the care. Now, if David loses his job, that is long-term poverty for that family. That's the sort of example we need to look at so that Martine, you know, should, they did get some better services for him so he could get a night's sleep. Um, but the services that they needed so she could read um, a story to her children. And now she's gone. How much more precious is that when we consider the sorts of memories that her children and her husband need with him? So Carers UK has also found that that um, when we looked at the stats of people juggling work and care, 600 people a day give up work to care. And social care plays an important part in that. That is a treasury cost to the exchequer. And it's a cost to those people in their <laughs> daily lives. Um, disabled people too, 46% of disabled people said they couldn't work. Again, productive people um, in their lives who, who want to work and want to, want, to, want to do that as well. Social care is absolutely vital. And there's a cost to business of people living, leaving work, of course, that's um, equivalent to uh, your salary, potentially. So for every disabled person and, and carer who leaves the labor market because they can't get the right kinds of services, that has a cost and an impact on the productivity of our economy. So what does, what does good care look like? What do, we, what do we get for our money? We get dignity, we get quality services, we get respect, we get the basic human rights that people should and are entitled to. We get good jobs for people as well, for people who care about people as well as for people. So we should be seeing this as an investment, not just a number. It's far more than that. So, and where we are at the moment politically, I mean, it was, it was, it was really great to see Boris Johnson talking about fixing the social care crisis once and for all for somebody that has campaigned for that to happen for the last 28 years. Um, I think we're in an extraordinary time where lots of the voices have very clear consensus that public funding is the way forward. We have absolute clarity on that, slightly different views about how that might be funded, whether it's personal care or more, but that is the most united we have ever been across all of our sectors. Um, the, the budget settlement was a recognition that that local authorities urgently need that funding and those families that we talked about and those people needing services um, are absolutely vital. And, and very clear consensus in the sector that voluntary insurance doesn't work. Just make that clear. <laughs> Nowhere in the world, Nowhere in the world does that work. And now that's accepted, which is also important. So in terms of what the Care and Sport Alliance and a lot of our so a sort of 80 plus organizations looking to the future, what, what should this look like? Um, our view is that the risk needs to be pulled. It's not something that we can easily plan for and nowhere in the world does that really work. So it has to be pulled on a whole adult population basis and it should be funded through taxation. So we discussed this all recently and that's the conclusion we made. And free should be, uh, sorry, care should be free at the point of use. Again, if you look at how services are used, if you make them free, it just frees up processes and it makes decisions easier for people who are con contributing. Um, there has to be an independent standardized um, eligibility threshold and set at moderate so we get prevention. And, um, and it has to include disabled, working age disabled people as well as older people. We can't have two systems. You might structure something slightly different, but it has to, the system absolutely has to cover everybody. And the final, the, the solution, the proposed solution has to increase support for unpaid carers. So some elements of personal care, for example, just focusing on that, whilst that would improve support for some carers, it doesn't doesn't necessarily help carers of people with learning disabilities or, or other conditions. So those are 
that's where we need to get to. Um, and I hope that um, I hope that we will get there there um, quickly. The words in due course and shortly strike fear into the heart of anybody, I think, probably who's worked on this and has seen, seen the green paper coming out shortly over the last two years. But um, as campaigners, we remain optimistic. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I think my former civil service training means in due course rolls off my tongue much easier than for other people. Um, I'm, next, uh, we're going to hear from Lord Forsyth. Um, and uh, Lord Forsyth has been chair of a Laws Economic Affairs Committee uh, that's published this year, which um, I think was remarkable for the sheer number of former chancellors uh, that you managed to persuade to sign up to a very large uh, additional amount of public spending, which is uh, something in in most of our experiences of trying to get Treasury to stop up the cash, we've not succeeded. So we're fascinated for, to hear from you, Michael, about your perspectives on the social care system and your recent report. Thank okay, you. Well, <clears throat> I, um, I'm not someone who uh, readily um, comes to the conclusion that we need to spend a lot more public money. Uh, and the uh, Economic Affairs Committee, which I chaired, uh, produced a report which we described social care as a national scandal. And normally we don't kind of go in for that kind of extreme language, but it is a national scandal. Um, I confess I started off thinking um, social care, this is about elderly people. First revelation, half the budget goes on people of working age, and yet the debate is not focused on that at all. Conclusion, I started off thinking, well, Dilnet sorted this, didn't he? I mean, it's about having a cap and you can have private insurance. And then as we looked at the evidence, it became apparent, well, actually, um, there isn't a market, um, according to the insurers. That's not going to work. How do you define a cap? Uh, and all of these things. And even though the legislation had been passed, I think, um, you'll correct me, was it in um, 2004? Yeah, 2014. You had a four in it. Um, uh, where, where there was the ability to, to introduce regulations. To introduce a cap, no regulations have been made. So we had a system which was unworkable. Now, I believe, um, as a Tory, as a, what people, some people describe as a right-wing Tory, I believe that a government has a duty to provide a net and a ladder, a net below which no one will fall, and a ladder for them to get out of the net. Now, in social care, we're dealing with people who can't climb a ladder, and we have a net which is full of holes and which is now tearing under the extreme strain of increasing demand. And the really shocking thing was to discover, actually, there are fewer people being helped now than there were in 2010, despite the increased demand, and to discover that actually what drives this and describes eligibility um, is, is diagnosis. So... I mean, you all know this, you're an expert on this, but for us it was a real revelation that you get help with basic care if you um, uh, have a health condition like cancer, but not if you've got dementia or motor neuron disease or some other um, terrible uh, uh, disabling uh, condition. And then the other thing was, uh, which um, really came out from Alison's program, is the postcode lottery that exists around the country and the pressure that the local authorities are under and the way in which um, uh, George Osborne's attempt to reduce the deficit by moving things off balance sheet has, which also, by the way, um, covered our views on student finance, but that's another story, but in this case by saying, well, we've made local authorities able to raise more money through the business rates when, of course, the demand and the ability to raise money through business rates varies according to geography. And the result is that you don't have a completely fair national system. So we came to the conclusion this has got to be funded nationally, um, that insurance will not work, and that was based on evidence. Evidence-based policy, of course, has become desperately unfashionable. I mean, it's, uh, um, Margaret Thatcher used to start every meeting by saying, what are the facts? And the facts here point to a need to spend different estimates, but roughly eight billion pounds, just to get us back to where we were in 2010, uh, and that we need to make 
basic care in terms of help with washing and feeding and all these things, um, we need to uh, enable that to be free to those who need it regardless of condition. And we need to fund the local authorities so that it is not the budget that determines need. Because what is happening is that the criteria uh, with people who are desperate to try and make ends meet at the local authorities, the criteria are becoming tougher and tougher and people who are uh, in need of help are, 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 not, um, are not given it. Now, um, since the electorate decided to ask me to leave the House of Commons in 1997, that's more than 20 years ago, there have been um, at least 12 green papers, white papers, policy statements, there have been um, five reviews, there have been a royal commission, and actually we have made no progress. Now, my committee, as uh, Chairman has indicated, consists of two former chancellors, one former permanent secretary at the Treasury, one former cabinet secretary, one chief executive of FTSE 100 company, one rather left-wing um, economist, um, and all people with experience and uh, abilities, and we had no difficulty whatsoever in reaching a unanimous conclusion that these are the things that needed to be done. Um, and it's very simple. The answer to this is not to have another green paper. I mean, the green papers are like Billy Bunter's postal order. I mean, you know, they're always going to arrive. What we actually need is the postal order. We need the Treasury to write a check, and it's quite a big check, and it's a check that's going to grow, and we need to plan uh, with that uh, in view. Uh, and the, um, uh, we were uh, uh, enormously assisted uh, by uh, Professor Richard Humphreys, uh, who managed to persuade me to come to a breakfast meeting here today. Uh, and I'm delighted to be here, although surrounded by people who know far more about the subject uh, than I do. But we felt that there was an absolute consensus. Now, if that's the case, why have we not got a solution after all these years? And I think this is to do with politics. I mean, when the Tories came up with a slightly half-baked solution at the last election, it was denounced as a dementia tax by Labour. When Labour um, came up with their solution, it was denounced by us as a death tax. And the truth of the matter is that actually there is a pretty strong consensus about what is needed is to have some centrally funded system that will treat all parts of the country fairly and which deals with some of the unfairnesses. And the unfairnesses about eligibility for care according to your um, uh, uh, condition, uh, the, the unfairnesses about self-funders having, uh, according to the Competition Commission, having to pay on average 43% um, more in order to fund those people who are uh, funded by the state. The result of that, of course, is that the care homes want to have more private funders and less uh, state funded people and therefore the number of places falls. But the one point, the one thing, when we took evidence over a period of six months, the one session that really um, uh, struck me uh, was we, instead of having pointy heads coming along and giving their evidence, we invited a whole load of carers to come and talk about their experience. It was hugely moving. I mean, here you have people who are paid less than people who are stacking shelves in Tesco and indeed people are being lost as carers because of the financial pressures upon them. These are people who have absolute conviction. For them, it's a vocation. They're paid very badly. They're treated not as a profession like nurses or whatever, and there is no proper career path or whatever. So I, the thing that struck me as most important is that if the money is there, even if we find the funding, given the increased demand, we have to look to the long term in order to provide a proper career structure and a proper reward for people who are doing this caring work because they are angels. I, um, one last point. Very strongly um, uh, came across to me is uh, I think the local government association did a survey. 48% of people that they surveyed did not know what social care meant. So why no political consensus? Because for most people, they haven't a clue about what's going on, and they only find out when granny needs care or when uh, they have some disability problem, perhaps. In the, and, the, and therefore, it's a sort of hidden scandal, um, which many people just live with day to day. Uh, they don't form protests. They don't write to their MP. 
I mean, somebody said um, in, on the uh, BBC programme, they said, um, oh, um, uh, well, I actually, um, I, you know, I, I hadn't had um, many constituents coming to my surgery um, because uh, so, uh, 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 pointing out the difficulties here. That is because they can't get out of the house because they are actually, um, and that's because the families are struggling to, to uh, make ends meet. Uh, so I, I welcome this. Uh, I do believe there's an opportunity. Unfortunately, the fact that we're facing a general election fills me with dread if we're going to have a repetition of what has happened in the past. So I hope it won't be an election issue. One final point. Secretary of State wrote to me last week in my capacity as chairman. This is what he said. He said, um, the government will set out plans in due course <laughs> to fix the crisis in social care once and for all, to give every older person the dignity and security that they deserve, and to protect children, parents, or grandparents from the fear of having to sell their home to pay for the cost, cost of care. Well, I hope and pray that these words are turned to a reality by whoever forms the next government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, and I'm now delighted to introduce our final panelist, Phil Hope. Um, Phil probably still has the scars uh, of the death tax because Phil was the minister who uh, piloted Labour, the Labour government building National Care Service white paper to publication, which I was also one of his civil service advisors for, so uh, there was a period of time we spent many hours locked in rooms trying to work out how to get Treasury to write a cheque. Um, so I'm delighted uh, to be able to welcome Phil, who, since moving away from frontline politics, has still kept a really close interest in how to help social care uh, get across the finishing line of, of reform we can deliver. So, Phil, over to you. Sally, thanks very much, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's a bit odd following the radical left uh, of the, uh, the Lords. Um, <laughs> Uh, suggesting uh, we should fully fund free social care, but um, it's fantastic. Um, and it does feel like the sort of grand old Duke of York. We've been up and down this hill so many, m many times. I remember when I was a minister, people said, well, how do you sleep at night with all this tension? And so I said, well, I sleep like a baby. I sleep for an hour and I cry for an hour. I sleep for an hour and I cry for an hour. But it, it, it is politics, Michael. You are absolutely right. Um, the first question I was asked was, why is this so difficult? And, of course, it's about how we raise money from people, and that is straightforward politics. It's about do people pay for themselves, or do we have a taxation system that raises it from everybody collectively and then uh, spends it on, on services? And, um, inevitably, that, because it's a political issue, we get political divides between people that want a, a low-tax system and a high-tax system, between people who want public spending uh, to go up or to go down, um, between people who think we should be making uh, more, pe more people pay, uh, uh, the wealthy people, pay more taxes uh, uh, to, to fund better services or, or not. Um, so uh, the, the truth is it, it does come down to some, some core political values that then get played out in terms of how political parties then uh, present their policies to, to the public. And the real problem, which is why it's so different from the NHS, is that not everyone will need social care uh, before they die. I mean, um, inevitably, practically everybody will use the health service at some point. Since 1948, the whole sort of culture's built up about this fantastic thing we have called the National Health Service, but the same doesn't apply and has never applied to the social care system in that way. So we haven't got that kind of popular uh, support for the social care system in the way that we have it for the NHS. And that maybe is part of why I, we see the NHS long-term plan talking a lot more about trying to integrate health and social care, because if social care can be more aligned, call it integrated with the NHS and that's the direction of travel, maybe through uh, devolution and so on, then maybe social care will sort of ride on the coattails of the NHS, the popular support of the NHS, because then there becomes popular support for health and social care, not just for health. Now, that's uh, one of the uh, reasons why I think it's so difficult. We, we don't have that, that happening at the moment. Um, uh, and and uh, I, I, I do think the point that was made by uh, Alison and uh, uh, Emily about unmet need is a real one here, is that because there is so much unmet need, the cost of providing free social care for everybody is a bit of a blank check at the moment. Now, I know, Mike, you, your committee came up with analysis and so on, but there is a concern that if that is the route that we take, and indeed that was what we said in the 2010 white paper building a national care service, let's have a comprehensive system free at the point of need, um, we're going to find a lot more need and therefore a lot more cost. And that, that's part of the fear, particularly in the Treasury and the arguments we used to have with Asda Darling and others at the time about where this is going to go is how do you make sure you don't 
find something that's unaffordable. And indeed, the same pressures are on the NHS at the moment as well. So the question, the second question, what are the prospects of reform? Well, in the current political climate, you're right, Michael, I think it's, it's not good at the moment. Uh, we want to try and prevent this becoming a political football again and try and build a cross-party consensus is the only way to go. But with so much uncertainty, not with this Brexit, a general election, probably another hung parliament, is there an appetite between the parties uh, to try and build that consensus? It, it, it's very difficult right here, right now, to see that that is possible. And I think this can, has been, inevitably, because of current events, been kicked down the road a bit. Not that it can't be done, but I think it's particularly difficult right, right, right now. Um, I also have to say the prospect of economic decline going forward is that those spending figures you talked about, the money needed, uh, uh, that, we, that we know is going to be tougher because we're going to be competing with a lot of other, other, other sectors that, that want the money. Um, and, uh, and I think that some of the recent pledges, the one and a half billion, I think it was, the, the, the immediate, you know, that, that, that as the LGA said, it kind of shores up the current system, keeps it just about ticking over. It certainly isn't a long-term solution to the answer. But there are pressures in the other direction. I mean, failure not to, to do something about this um, will lead to rising NHS costs. I think it's actually written into the long-term plan that if it's based on all the projections of the solutions and the money and what's been said about delivering the long-term plan, is based on no extra pressures coming from, more, uh, from, from less funding on social care. It was a remarkable document that the, 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 the government published, as it were, that said, this doesn't work if you don't sort out the social care system. So that's re re really important. Um, and, I, and it seems to me that we're seeing some sort of consensus between the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror, which is unusual, about this can't go on that the, the fact that people are losing their property, their inheritance is at risk because of the unfair system, which is where the Daily Mail, people shouldn't have to sell their homes to pay for their care, is very similar to where the other side of the political argument goes, which is we need to find a long-term solution. So maybe, whilst the politicians are having a difficult time trying to find consensus, maybe there's a sort of a public potential uh, unification across the two wings. Now, what would care uh, success look like? So... If I think my experience of the death tax debate was that people are worried about losing their inheritance, that they're having to sell their homes to pay for their care, and therefore they don't want to do that. Um, uh, uh, and we have a system in which, because of the randomness of who begets to need social care, I mean, some people have to sell their homes and use up all their savings, and some people don't. That's the unfairness that the Daily Mail, in particular, is very concerned about. Well, then why don't we have a system which is designed to protect that? Why don't we have a care levy on people's property which is designed to protect their inheritance, not run it down? So I would like to describe my solution as being an inheritance protection care levy. That is to say, everybody pays a little bit out of their inheritance to fund the social care system in the way that we think it's needed to protect the inheritance and the savings of the few that have got them uh, and would have them run down if, if this wasn't in place. Um, and because of a shrinking dependency ratio, and this is why I'm slightly anxious about funding social care out of general taxation, because of the shrinking dependency ratio, we've got fewer working age adults uh, generating income, uh, to, you know, generating uh, tax to pay for a growing aging population. And although I agree it is uh, not just older people that need care, but that's where the growth in demand for care is going to come from. It's also where the growth in wealth is sitting at the moment. And if we could tap into the growing wealth of older people's property, to fund the growing care needs of older people, but then we have an alignment who's paying for who's receiving, and we can do so in a fair way to protect everyone's inheritance, the inheritance of the working age population for when mum or dad eventually dies, they get their inheritance because everybody's paying a little bit of inheritance and everybody they're all guaranteed to get 90% of, of the inheritance that their parents are going to give them. And that there was the political problem of calling it a, a death tax and we're going to raid people's properties because everybody then is able to contribute. Uh, to do that, uh, uh, by the way, just to say, the idea of a ring fence, i.e. a care levy that's only for care, a ring fence property tax, is not new. It's happening right now in every council across the country. The council tax care premium is a ring fence property-based tax. It's just the wrong one, as Michael pointed out. It raises not enough money in the right places for the needs in the locations where the needs occur. A national 
ring fence property care levy uh, of the kind that I've described, an inheritance protection care levy, I think deals with the, in, the unfairnesses that we've, that we've just been uh, talking about. So I think that we need a new campaign. Now, I remember running the Big Care campaign. Some of you were here at the time, uh, which was in design to try and get this. We need another one of those Big Care campaigns about, uh, in my view, something called inheritance protection care levy to raise sufficient money on people's property to provide a fair system that is free at the point of need, uh, funded fairly and delivered so that everybody gets the care they want. If we don't go down that road, it's going to be more uh, make do and mend, uh, and the system is simply, as we're all involved with, is simply going to stumble along until eventually the NHS, not the social care system, the NHS system will find itself uh, unsustainable and unaffordable as well. Great, thank you very much, Phil, and all our panellists. Um, I'm going to take Chair's prerogative and ask a couple of questions to kind of hopefully get people's uh, thinking caps on uh, and then come to the floor for more questions. Um, so my first question, which I think I'll direct to Emily, um, we've heard a lot from all four panellists about the current challenges of the existing local authority funded, if you like, safety net. Um, and it does feel it's quite clear that that's the first place that money needs to go to whilst the politicians are debating how to uh, improve the overall structure of the system. So reflecting on the spending review last week, mm. is it enough? Was it better than you hoped for, better than you feared it might have been? Just what's your reflection about um, how, how was that helping us it's, carry on? It's, it's, it's important it's there. It's not enough. And why I said 1 billion and not 1.5 billion is because that the, the 500 million is made up of precept, which of course is then down to the local authority to decide whether they raise that from local funding. And it's just as Michael said, you know, that then becomes a postcode lottery for the poorest areas, some very difficult decisions. Um, Michael, you, you, your report said 8 billion immediately. Mm. So 1 billion is just about shoring up local authorities. But the fact that we have it for one year and now, and we have a political cycle, we need to have the budget and the local authorities settlement to bring that through so it becomes the reality for local authorities. And we quickly need a longer term settlement for the, for the short term, if you like. Yeah. Local authorities can't plan on a year by year basis. The charities that they commission, the services that they commission can't plan services on a year by year basis. It, that is the unsustainability of the system. So we need a, a minimum a three-year spending review coming uh, quickly. Very quickly. More very quickly. Coming. Yes. Um, and can I then also ask Michael and Phil to reflect on, um, so it's great to have the exclusive of the letter from Secretary of State um, exclusively writing a lot of the words which we've heard the Prime Minister uh, say. Um, and I suppose what strikes me about uh, what the, the Secretary of State said is he's defining the problem as older people and older people selling their own homes. But I think what we've heard from the panel today is the problem is much more complex than that, much more around quality, dignity, and it's not just about older people. So I suppose from the two politicians in the room, some advice, some reflections on how can we help um, move beyond that narrow framing of the problem to it being about inheritance and older people to a real recognition of the value of the social care system and therefore the importance of it for lots of parts of our society. Uh, well, um, I think you're being a bit unfair to the Secretary uh, of State. I mean, he said to give every older person the dignity and security uh, that they deserve and to protect children, parents or grandparents and from the fear of selling their homes. I, I, mean, I, uh, I mean, I feel a bit odd here because Phil is kind of taking a much kind of more Thatcherite position <laughs> than, than me. I feel quite uncomfortable. But, uh, uh, I mean, I'm the one who's saying this has got to be... I mean, I guess um, I see the problem, if you think of it from a, a sort of economist point of view, I, I see the problem as being um, unlike pensions policy, for example, where we're all going to get old and we're all going to need... Uh, uh, here, not everyone is going to find themselves in the unfortunate position. And, and therefore, I think the state has got to provide some kind of pool for the risk. Uh, and then it becomes about the funding. Now, because we're wanting to get a consensus, I'm not going to argue about whether you know, having a, an extra inheritance tax is the, is the solution. Uh, but actually, it is not the solution to what we have now. I mean, if you had Phil's scheme, 
you know, it would bring in revenue, but not now. And the money is needed now. Mm. The same with, you know, the Dillnut thing, where um, you would have insurance. Well, okay, I mean, uh, perhaps in the long term. Where, where I think Phil is absolutely right, of course, is what economists would call the deadweight cost, that actually you may get an additional surge in demand. But I think somehow we... we, we uh, and the other thing that worries me is, if it becomes part of the health service, uh, the health service is such an elephant. I mean, the very really shocking thing is, if it, what do we spend on, on the health service now? Something of the order of 130 billion, yeah. that sort of order, yeah? yeah. Uh, social care, 20, 20 billion. It's tiny. Uh, it, it is not a huge problem in terms of public expenditure, um, although it is a big ask. Uh, in terms of the immediate. But we don't have a choice. While this is going on, people are actually not getting the services they need. We are not recruiting the people that we need. Uh, this is an immediate, urgent problem. It's broken. And to my mind, there is no way around this other than writing a check. And believe me, I'm not comfortable with that. But I mean, politics, the old cliche, is the language of priorities. And if looking after the most frail and vulnerable people in our country is not a priority, what has happened to us? So I, I end up, as a Thatcherite, saying, we just got to do this as part of the state, and we have to remove the complexity. One of the problems is that people don't understand this until the crisis mm -hmm. hits them. And then, you know, they're, they're stressed and everything else. And what we have to do in terms, and we can do this without getting bogged down in what the answer is, if people understood what the problem was and how inadequate it was, then there would be, it would be easier to get a consensus for something which is only an issue for people when catastrophe hits them. But just three quick points. I mean, I, I agree with you that we need something immediately and now because we clearly see because we're all working in a system that is failing. Um, the question was, though, what's the long-term uh, solution to the social care system? And I do think that income tax isn't it. I do genuinely think we have to find a way of raising money from the wealth that is uh, uh, the trillions of wealth that is tied up in domestic properties, where most of those people with that money is unearned income, and that unearned income is there and could be tapped readily. And we've done the, we did the work in 2008, 2009 about how we would tap into that to provide enough and sufficient money to meet the needs uh, in the system without uh, going into uh, the need to raise income tax for all the reasons I've just, just given. Uh, I do think um, uh, that the issue around the, the, qu the quality of care uh, is, is paramount, and I agree with everything mm. that you said, Emily, about that. That's a, absolutely where we need to go, and that's what we try to do in spelling out the, the new thresholds and the new standards and the CQC and so on to try and ensure that is the case. But the fundamental question, which is in the Secretary of State's letter, is the politics of how we are going to raise more money. And the politics are that the people are frightened of, of having to sell their own homes. So why don't we address that directly? Why don't we say you don't have to sell your own homes because everybody is going to contribute a small amount of the value of their homes to mean nobody has to sell their own homes to pay for the care that they need. That way, we, 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 dub, we, we hit both, both targets. We get the money we need and we address the key... There wouldn't be a death tax debate. If we can achieve a political consensus, we would have a solution, long-term solution, to funding social care. And my final point about uh, the, the NHS is I, we had a big care debate, Mark. We, we, we had a real work, I mean, all around the country, we spent a lot of money trying to get to people to understand what the care system was, who, who gets it, how it works. And, uh, and fantastic, so many people turned up from the charity world, so many people turned up from the world of local authorities. We could not, re we couldn't get through, we couldn't penetrate to the public mm. to change public perceptions. And that was despite a massive campaign uh, to do so. So I'm, that's why I would think that the, the inevitability of the integration of the health and social care system, which has to happen if we're going to stop bed blocks, and, uh, uh, and de delayed tra transfers of care and all of that. That has to happen anyway. So why don't we embrace that and go with that and get ourselves aligned and have a single system, perhaps through devolution, which is a, uh, an area which I think uh, holds of solutions, d a, a devolved, integrated local health and social care system funded jointly through the way the NHS is funded at the moment, plus new money coming in from uh, uh, property uh, taxation uh, through my inheritance protection care levy, I think provides a long-term solution to clear away the political arguments that would still go on year on year even if we took the solution you were trying to, uh, to take because every chancellor would come in and say well I know it's a good idea but the, what about the police and what about the defence you, know, you have those debates and, and I think we've got to find a structural solution to that challenge
Great. Thank you very much. So now uh, the chance to hear from uh, you all in the room. Uh, so we've got roaming mics, hands up. I'll collect two or three questions at a time uh, because she's my former boss. I'm going to have to go Andrea first. Uh, <laughs> I'll get into trouble mm -hmm. otherwise. Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> then we'll come back uh, uh, behind Andrea. Sorry. I knew there had to be some privileges <laughs> of, of being your boss at one stage, Sally. Um, uh, first thing I just wanted to say was thank you all very, very much. Um, uh, brilliant presentations and wonderful to hear such consensus coming out. And uh, three quick points. The first is how important it is that we get that consensus and we get the um, messages out to people to understand what the system is like and how complicated it is. My parents are now in and out of hospital, in and out of the social care system. I find it ridiculously complicated to navigate. And I used to be the Chief Inspector of Adult Social Care at CQC, and I do the job I do now. Um, you, know, If I can't do it, um, for my parents, how on earth do people who don't understand the system? And I'm not the only one. There's so many people I talk to in health and social care who say, say the same thing. And one of the critical things that Alison really brought this out in her program is how dependent people are on other members of their family to navigate that system and support. And one of the things that's not been mentioned is the time bomb that we have, which is that one in five people over the age of 50, including me, is aging without children. I will not have somebody looking out for me the way I'm looking out for my mum and dad. And I think that the pressure that we're building up for the future is significant and it's not really being considered or addressed by policymakers. And if we don't think about it, um, uh, uh, th it'll be a significant problem. The final point, um, and uh, I should have introduced myself, Sally. I, <laughs> um, uh, Andrew Sutcliffe, uh, Chief Inspector, uh, uh, Chief Inspector, Chief Executive of the Nursing and Midwifery Council. My final point is to um, reflect upon the fact that yes, we do need a cheque to be written, but I also think that we need to think about what does that cheque get written for. Um, and what do we spend it on? And you made some really good points, um, Lord Forsyth, about uh, care workers, but I'd like to highlight the issue of nursing um, because we know that demand is going up. We know that we need more nurses in adult social care, and the recent figures from Skills for Care demonstrate that nurses in adult social care are reducing. Um, as a consequence, um, care providers are withdrawing from providing nursing home provision um, at a point when we need it more. At the same time, we have an NHS um, interim people plan, which is resolutely focused on nursing and uh, other professions in the health service. And that's despite the fact that the National Audit Office has said we need an integrated plan and a workforce plan for adult social care. We know that that's essential. The work that we did at CQC on the local system reviews demonstrated people weren't looking at this in an integrated way at a local level. Well, hey, what a surprise, because we're not doing it at a national level. So I think that there's, you know, we have to take the, the, the debate a wee bit further into what are we going to spend this money on and to make sure that some of those uh, issues about the workforce are properly addressed in this debate. Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman and the row behind you. Uh, yep. Yeah. And then I think we'll... Hello everyone, uh, my name's uh, Charles Armitage. I'm uh, a doctor and currently founder of a um, technology company called Florence that helps care providers manage their workforces. Um, so having spent some time working in the NHS in departments like accident and emergency and uh, care of the elderly, specifically rehabilitation, two fairly critical interfaces between the health and care sectors. One of the most striking things that you notice is the massive lack of trust and um, suspicion um, between work, 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 the workforce within the NHS and social care. And a classic case would be that someone gets referred in from the community at three o'clock in the morning and everyone's grumbling about inappropriate referral. And actually the um, reality on the ground of working in a brightly, brightly lit and well-staffed A&E department mm -hmm. at three in the morning is very, very different mm -hmm. to people working out in the community who are often under-supported, under-trained, underdeveloped, and you know, an example in, from um, the chance recently of uh, um, pledging a thousand pounds per per nurse within the NHS, but not social care is a really like gleaming demonstration of that. Um, my question is: Is there any way to break down those barriers of mistrust and encourage a collaborative environment apart from bringing both health and social care under the same funding umbrella? Is there anything short-term we can do? 
And I think there was one other arm up in this central bit. Yeah, so fourth row the gentleman. Yeah, the black glass is that one. No, it's you. Yeah, it was. Did you not? Yeah, it was. Sorry. Uh, hi, I'm Joe Fielder. I'm the chair of two NHS trusts in North East London. Um, enormously encouraged by this growing consensus that something very, very significant needs to be done. But I guess I would have two areas of information flow that I think would be helpful for many of us. Um, Lord Forsyth, you mentioned 120, 30 billion versus 20 billion. I think we could all do with understanding what does the work that's being done on a continuous basis inform that that ratio should really look like. And my second question would be, if we get that funding right, could we do more and what prevents us? Because um, it's interesting to see the toggle of opinion between sort of ex-active politicians forming consensus once you're out of power. <laughs> Why can't we do more to get more consensus when politicians are active and in power? Thank you. Yeah, very good question. I did, particularly when I saw the uh, committee report, I did think it's blooming lovely that all these former chancellors and former <laughs> pansecs have suddenly found the checkbook. Um, so I'll ask the panel uh, on these three questions, then I'll come back round to the floor. So do, um, if you have any questions, start to think about those. So, um, Emily, I wonder if you could pick up the point around um, ageing without children mm. and what particular additional uh, sort of pressures that might put in the systems in terms of where does the advocacy and the mm -hmm. support mm -hmm. and the help navigating come from? Well, I think, I think as it goes back to the original title of this as fixing social care once and for all. Because our demographics are changing, we need to re-engineer that every decade or so. And other countries have shown, like Germany and Japan, they re-engineer it. And actually, our organisation, Carers UK, was set up primarily by, by women who had no children. Um, and we have to think about this generation as well, um, who are most likely to be caring for parents into the future. And some um, research that Carers UK did this, this summer found that 68% of carers were spending their own savings on care. So we are, if we are in danger of, of, um, of taking taking resources away from the current generation um, into the future. And Andrea's point also about navigating the system, um, and I want to sort of come back to the A&E point as well, is that if you look at the number of people who are juggling work and care in the NHS, it's approximately a quarter of a million people. And that they have not realised that the people there, when you have trouble going through A&E, that's a nurse, that's a GP's receptionist, that's a doctor, those are valuable staff that are also all struggling with the same social care system mm. and the health system. And the more we can do to recognise that the people within our workforces have health conditions, have disabilities, are caring for relatives, perhaps the closer we can get to integration, actually if people think about more about their own personal experiences. Thank you, Emily. Um, so turning to the question around trust between different teams, I wonder if I could ask Alison from perspective about what you might see on the ground in Somerset about what works there, but also Phil, you'd be doing a lot of work on devolution and joint working. So your perspective, how, how can we better uh, uh, break down that mistrust? Um, I think from what I've seen, not just in Somerset, but in different parts of the country, it, there is work being done to try and increase that trust. I think there are um, issues around understanding as well. You know, I think you're absolutely right if you're in a brightly lit A&E. Mm -hmm. It's a very different feeling to being a care worker um, who has arrived and they have found someone who's fallen on the ground. They have to stay with them, but they also know that there's another vulnerable elderly or disabled person who needs them and they're meant to be there in 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and that means that sometimes the solutions which are found are, are cobbled together, frankly. Um, I guess in the, in the best way, it, it will need to, to be that... There's been a lot of talk within the NHS and within CARE about making everything more people-centred as opposed to building-centred. If you start to get things which are more people-centred, what individual needs, I would imagine you will then start to get that better understanding and, and integration. And we've seen that to some degree with um, consultations via Skype in care homes or GPs going into care homes and so on. But 
obviously more people are living in their own homes for longer. So uh, from what I've, the examples I've seen, it seems to me there needs to be a lot more time spent on how you make those two systems function together. And there is also the issue which Andrea has raised about the difference in perceptions <coughs> of roles. So a nurse working in the NHS is likely to get mm. paid more, but also possibly more respect for the job that she does, or he does. And um, you actually need, that needs to be fixed as well if you are going to get a system that is integrated and works better. Thank you, Alison. Yeah, um, uh, there's a number of things to say. Uh, the, the first thing is I, I've worked a lot with organisations like Age UKs up, up and down around the country who are uh, delivering schemes to prevent <coughs> unplanned admissions among older people that don't need to be in hospital because it's the last place they need to be and to get people out of hospital quicker. And I think commissioning, uh, finding out what works and then commissioning these kind of literally face-to-face -face programs where people are sitting in A&E getting people out before they go in as it were. There's lots of solutions to these uh, challenges that have been worked up and indeed are in the long-term plan and they've been vanguard. So I think there are very practical answers to those questions but they're not enough. And I like the idea of the community hospitals which I often see as a, uh, sorry, uh, of acute hospitals as being sort of a black hole, a centre of gravity into which all patients and money flow. Uh, then turning into more anchor community institutions in which they, they look outwards to their community and work jointly with the new uh, primary care networks that are being developed uh, with, uh, with the voluntary sector and others and the social care system to, to, to see themselves not just as a building into which people go get treated and come out again, but as being genuine players in the community to try to uh, make sure that the money gets spent not in the acute, actually, but in the system around it, in the communities around it. And I think fundamentally to achieve that, we're going to have to put these new structures in place that I've been talking about, which is the devolution point, which is if you take places like Greater Manchester, where you get local authorities and the health service merging their budgets, putting a single account officer in place, and then saying, OK, how can we now run all of this so that we actually have people being treated where they should be treated and not going into institutions where they don't need to be and which make them worse by the time they come out, then I think we could find a, an answer. And that, that devolution, I know it's not very popular, it's not a thing that government's talking about very much, but if you are going to have genuine integration between between a system that's basically local and looks outwards to the side, with an institution called the NHS which looks up and down with its accountability. The only solution to that is to create these geographical footprints, like Greater Manchester and other areas, uh, in which these, uh, uh, these, comp comp these two can be combined together, and you can have a fully integrated system aligning the incentives for patients and the money to flow and be in the right place. Thanks, Phil. Um, I'm just going to add a quick reflection on the kind of integration point and the mistrust point. Um, partly to hark back to Lord Forsyth's uh, comment about evidence-based policy being out of fashion. Um, I think that we, uh, there's, it's a really easy uh, kind of thing to suggest that the NHS is perfectly integrated amongst itself and the issue is how the NHS integrates with social care. And that absolutely yeah. is not the case. No. The NHS is not well integrated with itself. So no. I think the so, idea yeah. that putting the NHS and social care together, if you just had it under a single funding pot, would magically solve the integration problem in the trust, I think is flawed. I think it's much more around... Uh, relationships, understanding each other's organisations, its purpose, thinking about being people first uh, and designing your systems around people rather than around your organisation. So I think there is a, a bit of a risk that we always think the problem is the and social care bit as opposed to the problem being how does health and social care as a whole combine its services and really deliver early intervention and support for people. Can I so, just yes, very briefly comment <clears throat> on um, the point that was uh, made by, I think, Emily uh, about um, complexity. I mean, I read the regulations that cover entitlement to mm. care, um, which actually Richard uh, got for me. It's about 96 pages, I think. Uh, and I find, and I've, I've spent 36 years dealing with legislation and regulations. Uh, and it's hugely complex, hugely contradictory, mm. leaves huge loopholes for local authorities to interpret it under financial pressure. So I totally agree with about the complexity and so which is what attracts me mm. to free entitlement in part. Charles's point about um, his experience in, in A&E, when we had the people who were involved in social care giving evidence to us, one of them said, we have no status or standing, and she described how she was helping someone who'd had a fall and was shoved out of the way by a paramedic and saying, you're just a care worker, yeah? And that, I mean, that is a problem. And now, I... 
I mean, there's a, there's a role here, for, talked about the, the, the nursing and midwifery council. We need to have some kind of professional body for carers that sets standards and, and, and the rest. And then the point that was made by the gentleman at the back um, was the an unenviable task of uh, running two health authorities about where would the money go. This is why I'm nervous about it, integrating it with the health service uh, and not having a single national funding system. I think it's sleeping with an elephant. And the urgent always, always forces out the important. And, and I, I think until we actually have a, 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 a system which will uh, channel the funds which are needed, I, I think it will be quite difficult. But because we want to have a consensus, don't want to argue about what the system should be. Um, but I, I, I do think that the points that have been made by everyone um, are, are, are strongly support them. Great. I'm going to come back to the floor now. So let me just see what hands we've got up. Uh, so we're going to go, can we go Charles first and then uh, this lady on the second row here. So Charles is grey suit uh, by the aisle here. Mary Ellen. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I've really enjoyed the contributions from everyone. So one question is that every one of these debates I go to, people talk about how we should raise the money to pay for this. No other sector talks about this. When we put the 20.5 billion into the NHS recently, yeah. which is way more than the total amount of spending on the social Absolutely care system, right. we didn't talk about how we raise that money, even though lots of the issues are the same. You could view the NHS as an inheritance protection scheme for old people because they actually provide very costly care to people at the end of their lives. I wonder, should we just stop talking about that? Because the Treasury always views that as its own territory anyway. And the idea of people in the social care sector telling the Treasury how to raise money strikes me as slightly naive. Thank you, Charles. We'll come to this uh, lady. Hi, thanks for some very interesting reflections. I just wanted to um, offer some reflections from Germany and Japan. I'm um, oh, sorry, I should introduce, introduce myself. I'm Natasha Curry from the Nuffield Trust. We've been looking at the Japanese and German systems because they are the two countries that have implemented new social care systems by raising money from their populations from scratch. And I think there are two things that I would reflect on that made that possible in those places. The first was a genuine political will and consensus and cross-party working to come to a solution, a recognition that, that it was about how to solve it, not whether to solve it. And the second one is about the, the the public understanding, and I think we've covered this quite a lot, but I think um, it was really crucial in both countries that the offer that was on the table was very clear in terms of what you're going to be paying in and what the benefit is going to be. And they have a national uh, eligibility process. They have monthly benefits attached to your level of need. There is a, there's a great clarity there to what you pay in and what you get out. And I just think in our debate, we too often leap to what's the funding solution, what's the funding mechanism, without taking the step back that I think Andrea reflected on about what is it that we want the system to do and what is it going to be. And then I think that that public debate might become a bit easier, perhaps. Thank you, Natasha. And I think there was a hand at the back, so furthest back corner. I think that lady's been waving at me. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Judith Brody. I'm currently in from CEO of 38 Degrees, which is a campaigning organisation. Mm -hmm. I've spent most of my career in and around health and social care. Um, I completely agree with the comments about needing cross-party action and needing to enhance public understanding of social care. Uh, but I'm afraid I don't share Emily's optimism. I have seen... Um, Social care has been in crisis for, for years, if not decades. Um, and it has been in crisis. I've seen that. And nothing has happened. Nothing has been done. Uh, Lord Forsyth talked about the 12 in, uh, reviews or investigations plus. Um, so I, I, I do sort of despair. Um, so really, I suppose my question is, you know, there's a lot of power and influence in this room, it seems to me. Um, I wonder what we can do what we can take away uh, individually and collectively from today uh, that might actually make a difference. What, what can we do to actually make this happen finally after these, all these years? Great, thank you. And I think there's one lady in the back row. Yeah, and then, uh, then I'll come to the panel. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm Mary Dushevsky. I'm a journalist and um, former carer. Um, and I'd like to offer two points. Um, one of them, I'm not, I would like to question um, keeping the social care system um, united between um, working age and um, older people because I think the perception is that this is a gigantic burden on society caused by older people. And it's not appreciated that half the budget goes on non-older people. And this feeds into what I regard as a very pernicious debate at the moment, which is the war of the generations. Um, so I think that's quite an important clarification. Um, the other thing is, as a former carer, um, I would like to um, suggest one uh, small saving of money um, on the gigant the mountain of literature which is produced, including by Carers UK. I have shelves of the stuff, and part of this is to do with what I also regard as a, uh, as a term which ought to be abolished called signposting. <laughs> which is that you go to see somebody, you talk to somebody over the phone, you call a care line, and what you get is somebody whose job is supposedly signposting you to the information, as though you had all the time to read through these 95 pages of detailed regulations. This is useless. You need to speak to somebody who can actually do something. And it's not... People are ticking boxes of saying, we've pointed somebody in the right direction. That's not good enough. Thank you. Great. So, uh, panel, um, I think, Michael, could I ask you to reflect on Charles's question of kind of should we, should we stop trying to solve Treasury's problem for them and just make the case for why social care needs the cash? And, let, you know, you've managed to persuade several chances formers to sign a blank check. Should we now just leave it at that and let them work out how to pay for it? I thought Charles's point was brilliant. I wish I'd yeah. thought of it. It's a, <laughs> yeah. um, and just you had a little pop at... Um, politicians who when they're no longer in power you know uh, actually it wasn't like that uh, in our committee we all started off with our with our prejudice and views none of us knew about the point that's just been made about 50 percent of the budget going on on people of working age uh, all of us had in mind different different um, schemes the reason that we reached a consensus is because unlike the other place lords committees we are not able to put forward any conclusions that are not based other than on the evidence we've received. And the evidence uh, points uh, clearly in one direction. Just, may I just pick up on the point that was made about um, Germany and Japan? Mm. Now, in Germany, everyone has to contribute, uh, everyone of working age who's in employment has to contribute 3% of their salary. Uh, half of that is met by the employers. Funnily enough, if you've got no, child no children, you have to pay an extra quarter percent. At the end of that, you're guaranteed that you will get basic care. You've got a, a, the state will pay 50% of the costs, and then you're expected for, to get insurance to cover the remainder. It's an interesting scheme, but it's a it's a very long-term solution. It doesn't deal with the problem that we have now, which and and I so much agree with Charles. If we get if we get go down that rabbit hole, the Treasury will mixing metaphors will have us for breakfast. We have to focus on the immediate crisis. Now, by all means, look at Germany and Japan and others, but there are no countries in the world which have got pri wholly private-funded schemes. Now, one of the problems, if you're a youngster, is you're being told you've got to pay this 3% um, levy um, for something that may or may not happen to you in 50 years' time. And we've seen my government, in particular, messing around with pensions, changing the rules, changing so that people are no longer confident about the long term. And, sorry, if I'm a youngster and I'm said, you, you, you can enter the scheme and in 50 years' time it will do this for you, I'm thinking, politicians telling me what's going to happen in 50 years' time. I think it's very, very hard to market or, or, or sell the scheme of that kind. The lady at the back who talked about what can be done, well, you're in a really good position because you're running one of these campaigning organisations um, which can inform people about what is required. And, and actually make this an issue which um, should be taken forward on a consensus basis. Right. I'm going to come back to Judith's question as actually our kind of final uh, opportunity for you to all, uh, all reflect, uh, actually. So um, maybe, Emily, could I ask you to pick up Mary's points, mm. uh, both around so signposting advocacy, in effect, because the system's so complicated, that what needs to go around it to help people navigate 
free. That's yes, and I'd also like to pick up on the, on the, the important point about people who are of working age and, yeah. and are disabled, because of course disability, a long-term condition can happen at any point towards your, I mean, working age, we don't, you know, under, under state pension age, shall we say. Um, and, and, that's, and when you experience that in your family, you might have, you know, that's, it, it, it happens both ways. It can have working age and you can have an older person in your family, both of whom need care. And that's why we, that's why we need to consider they, the, the care in the round. It's so important. Um, and to, to Mary's point about the, it's the challenges of the complexity of the system as well. Imagine if we had a really clear system how much easier that would be to provide the information and advice. Mm. If, imagine if we had a system where, as Andrea said, you didn't have to fight either for yourself or your relatives. That is the aim, really, of where we, where we want to be. And although we can use different literature and digital tools, the complexity of the system requires us to distill that 96 pages of guidance. And that's just in one area yeah, of the law. That right. doesn't cover all the others, like power of attorney or um, benefits and welfare system. So we really, it, it, the amount of time that people spend just trying to manage that is phenomenal. And that impacts on health, well-being, work, in many different areas of their lives. So um, I, I think we're all united in a system that people can understand. Great, thank you very much, Emily. Um, do any of the panel members want to reflect? As I say, I'm gonna come back to the question about actions. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to pick up that point about uh, just let the Treasury get on with the problem of, yeah. of raising the money. My experience in government was that if you wanted to get the Treasury to do anything, you had to have a strong evidence base to prove that it was uh, valid to spend that money on it. Um, uh, so that was the sort of the, the, the rational, logical part of what you needed to do. But you also needed muscle to try to get them to do what you wanted. And the only muscle that really the Treasury will ever listen to is the Prime Minister, is number 10. So when we were developing the white paper in, in 2009-10, it was because Gordon at the time was absolutely adamant we were going to get this uh, over the line, that uh, we had endless uh, cabinet subcommittee meetings and various other things between Treasury, the Spending Department, Department of Health, and somebody from number 10 to try to arrive at something that would get us over there, get the Treasury to put a, their name to the white paper that we've eventually got published. We lost the, lost the election, which is a great shame, but we, it, it was absolutely necessary that we had to have the Treasury fully engaged with us and with the Prime Minister to try to solve this problem. Without that, then I don't think the, tr the Treasury will just sit back and say, we can't afford it. Okay. So uh, it's not as though we're trying to find solutions for the Treasury because they've got very clever people that can do that. It is that we have to find the right uh, arena in which those three locuses of power in government are as one, and we have that internal consensus and <laughs> we're cross-party working within government between the, the, the departments, as well as trying to get cross-party outside of government between the different political parties. Can, can I just say, I, I totally agree with that, and, and um, just to further ruin my reputation, I mean, what, one, area, one area where we could actually get more revenue is, um, I'm 65 next month, um, but I, I'm not of pensionable age until next year, apparently. Um, but even though I'm earning, I don't have to pay national insurance contributions, although um, my employer does. Now, when I put down a parliamentary question to ask how much would it raise if people who were over retirement age paid national insurance, it's one and a half billion, you know, which would go quite a long way. What is the reason for that? And there was another House of Lords. Michael, yeah. Gordon Anthony. wanted, that was one of Gordon's answers. When, in two, do you remember, Sally? That was, <laughs> that was his preferred option. Um, and, but, and he was Prime Minister, and he couldn't convince Alistair to do it. But anyway, um, well, there we are. That's, well, that's, I've okay. convinced okay. Alistair. <laughs> <laughs> it's in our it's like report. We need a side room of let's, uh, let's get the politicians talking about House of Treasury. I think Charles's point is, is a really interesting point, because I think the long-term funding settlement for social care is almost unique in being a public policy that we try and look from a public lens of public services supporting people, but yet we have to seek how to fund it, whereas mm. you don't do that with the mm. NHS, with mm. police, mm. with schools. So it is quite unique, and it does mean that we've tended to get boxed into positions. We have five minutes left, so that's my subtle hint to the panel to please be quick with my, uh, the final question, which is drawing on Judith's point. So what I uh, kind of wanted to finish with was to ask you each the same question, which is, uh, Judith asked, what can we do collectively and individually uh, to get ref kind of make improvements <laughs> to get reform happening? So I'd be interested in your, your reflections on that. And then finally, a 
are you optimistic or pessimistic about the next 12 months for social care? So I'm going to start uh, closest to me, so Alison, uh, and go along the line. So. Well, um, I mean, I've been covering this area for a long time now and therefore have done a lot of covered, reported on a lot of those reports, commissions, green papers, white papers, and uh, it does frequently feel like we're just going around in ever-decreasing circles, so it would be nice to move to something that is concrete. In terms of what, what we can do collectively, um, well, in my role <laughs> as, as a journalist, it's to keep telling, trying to tell the story, as I know many of my colleagues do. Um, but I think it is, it's the conversation, it's the educating people, helping people understand. But it's also coming up with some sort of solution which has clarity and certainty. And I thought it was very interesting uh, what you said about Germany and Japan, Natasha, about having a very clear solution of what you pay in, what you pay out, what, what is it that we are talking about. And um, I think any time you talk about adult social care, you actually spend the first few minutes of that conversation explaining what it is, when it comes in, what you have to do. Um, and it's confusing. The complexity is bamboozling. So I think some solution that is worked together that has clarity and certainty uh, at the same time as educating and talking to people, continually talking to people so they know what it is that is at stake. And in terms of optimistic, oh, do you know, that changes almost week by week. <laughs> <laughs> I, um, at different times during this last year, have felt actually things mm. are moving forward. And I've had conversations about, yes, I think there'll be a green paper, a white paper or something within the next few weeks. And then that um, shifts around <laughs> as everything else is shifting around at the moment. So, so today, um, it's, where are it, we? Today, oh, do you know, I don't, I don't think I can call it because I know I will be wrong by this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I suspect some other panel members might copy that answer. <laughs> um, Emily? Um, collectively and individually, I think we, we, we need to continue doing what we're all doing in actual fact. Evidence sharing our consensus you know if you haven't read charles's paper then please do charles that's an excellent paper just all of us contributing different knowledge to this and um working where we can a reflection on 38 degrees it's really interesting because i think we we, we we met you in in uh, about 2008 and it was really interesting that at that time because it's a grassroots organization we were interested in getting social care on the agenda but as a grassroots organization that was not coming up through the network so the fact that we are at a point now where that is really really matters and it is part of the big care debate as we go forward. Optimistic, pessimistic. Why I said optimistic is because if you look at the alternative, pessimistic, it's never going to happen. That is not a place I want to be. Okay. I want to be in a place where this does happen. We have great knowledge within the civil service about how this all works. We have extraordinary experts in the sector. All we need is the politicians to come together and for Treasury to write that check. Um, I, I, that is, that's where I am. On the politics at the moment, it is a bit complicated, isn't it? Let's face it. <laughs> so, but um, but that's, that's where I am. Brilliant. Um, and some very quick reflections from Michael and then Phil, please, on the same question. After the financial the crisis, um, things got so bad, I stopped calling myself a banker and started calling myself a politician again. <laughs> <laughs> now I started calling myself a banker again. Um, I, I am optimistic. Um, I do think, you know, uh, there's a Scottish expression, um, facts are chills that want a ding. I mean, it's the facts are such that it has to happen, whoever's in power. Um, what should we be doing? I think what you've done this morning is what we should be doing. Um, uh, what Alison's been doing as a journalist is what we should be doing. I mean, I think her, her programs really shone a light on this yeah. for people who... So um, I am optimistic, but then if you're in politics, you have to be optimistic, <laughs> although it's increasingly challenging um, uh, given where we are. If we could just get the B word out of the way and get um, an election at some point and get a 
government um, in power with a reasonable majority and whoever it is, if we could get a degree of consensus, then I think this can be, can be, can be, can be tackled. Great. Thank you. Phil. Uh, well, well, one, one, one other point, sorry. Um, just on, um, this is a subset of a much bigger picture which is about the whole change in demography and the whole change in the workplace and the, the point that was made about people who've got no children. And who in government is actually looking at this? The Treasury are always just short-term thinking about the money. We need to have a much, much uh, broader look at this, which may end up with, with the kind of ideas that Phil has been talking about. But it's a, it's, it, there is a huge change happening which will affect our children and our grandchildren, and this is but one subset of it. So in the very short term, I think uh, if we can get every manifesto to say we want to sort of sort out the problem of the long-term funding of social care and immediately provide some cash to keep it uh, in, in the way you described, I think that would be a very good thing to do over the next few months. Uh, once that's happened, I suspect we'll be in for more coalition governments of one kind or another. Coalition could mean opportunities for mm -hmm. compromise, for joint working, for cross-party consensus. So I'm feeling optimistic that the strange political world that we currently inhabit might just open up the door because we haven't got this kind of straight forward two major parties battling it out, we may end up with coalitions of one kind or another, and those coalitions might be able to uh, uh, arrive at new solutions, uh, new ways of thinking. Um, and as, uh, when I was a spending minister, what helped me the most was when the people out there uh, were really angry about something and saying, get this sorted, because then I would go back to the Treasury and say, well, I've got to get this sorted because they're really angry out there. So I think if there is a campaign, a continuing campaign, to improve the funding of social care, whatever that answer might be, and I would, I would also argue to, to link it closely with the NHS more to make it a, an integrated system to stop all this, these problems of navigation and signposting and so on, if we could get that, if we could get the noise happening much more frequently, like today, uh, over and over, over the next uh, six months, 12 months, uh, that, that helps ministers, oddly enough, to then argue the case inside government. When there's a sort of critical friend, not just shouting at us saying we're rubbish, but shouting at us saying do this and do this well, then that, that does help you uh, uh, perhaps move the, move the issue forward within government. Thank you very much. Um, so we've come to we just agree. after 10 o'clock now, so I'm going to draw today uh, to a close. Thank you very much for your time for your questions. Apologies that I couldn't get round to all of your questions. Um, if you put anything on Twitter, I will try to respond during the course of the day. Uh, so please do carry on bringing your questions in. So I'd just uh, end by saying, can we thank our panel in the usual way for their expert contributions? <laughs>